John F. Kennedy was president for only three years, yet his time in office was marked by major events both foreign and domestic. JFK steered the country through the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement and dramatically expanded the space program. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. His brief administration is often referred to as a utopian Camelot, a mythology that overshadows both his failures and his accomplishments. Incomparable Grace, JFK and the Presidency is a new book by Mark Updegrove, President and CEO of the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation and the presidential historian for ABC News. We are captured by this luminous and intriguing and in some ways enigmatic president who leads us through almost three consequential years. Incomparable Grace is a brisk, focused account of JFK's presidency, revealing a leader who learned from his mistakes and rose above them. Mark Updegrove, great to have you here today to talk about your book, Incomparable Grace, JFK and the Presidency. Thanks so much for, for having me. I'm going to start broadly with the title, Incomparable Grace. Why was that the title you chose? It was because I had written a book some, some years back about LBJ called Indomitable Will, LBJ in the Presidency. And Indomitable Will just captures the essence of LBJ. And in that same manner, Incomparable Grace captures JFK, particularly when he took the presidency. This is a guy who wins the presidency by two tenths of a percentage point. It, the, it was the most narrow victory of the 20th century. And yet, he, as, as, as he takes the helm as president, he captures the imagination of the American people. There is a, a glamour and an elegance and an eloquence that he exudes and so he takes the presidency with a grace that's incomparable to any of his predecessors. We are captured by this luminous and intriguing and in some ways enigmatic president who leads us through almost three consequential years. I wanted to show how tempestuous and how dramatic and how triumphant in many respects and hopeful this time was in American life. And the best way of doing that was to look at the, 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 the presidency chronologically from episode to episode, from chapter to chapter, because no sooner had John F. Kennedy gotten through one crisis than he was dealing with another. There was so much going on at that time in history. You know, it's, it's, there, there are two facets to the grace thing. One is the, the, the more superficial aspects of, of that grace. And I mentioned them when, when, uh, JFK took office. We saw that. We saw this young, vigorous, handsome president who was so eloquent. And we all remember his and inauguration so speech, America. ask not and what your country not. can do for you, ask what, what you can do for your country, you. getting us to and reach beyond ourselves at a very important time in our history. But as uh, he, I think, found his himself in the presidency, as he his experience deepened, and he gained greater maturity uh, and grew into the office, that grace deepened as well. It is most manifest in the Cuban Missile Crisis. There is an equanimity that comes from John F. Kennedy during that incredibly perilous and dangerous moment in American history that is what Ernest Hemingway would have said is the definition of courage, which is grace under pressure. And we see that from John F. Kennedy. He was a big Hemingway devotee. He was a huge fan of, of Hemingway's and, in fact, used that quote in his book, Profiles in Courage. But that grace, again, is, is seen in that most dangerous moment from John F. Kennedy. So I think the incomparable grace is, is multifaceted, but it fits John F. Kennedy as much as any two words I could find. I was just going to ask you about the Cuban Missile Crisis, because that does seem to me a time of great grace and resolve that he demonstrated in bringing that very scary moment to a, to an end, a diplomatic end. So could you talk a little bit about that? H happily, Kathy, let me um, preface this by saying that in some ways, 
John F. Kennedy brought that crisis on himself in, in, in a matter of speaking. Nikita Khrushchev was his counterpart in the Soviet Union, a very truculent, very aggressive adversary. This is during the height of the Cold War. Dwight Eisenhower had held the office of the presidency for two terms before John F. Kennedy's election. And this is the hero of D-Day. And uh, the, the Soviets did not mess with Dwight Eisenhower. But when John F. Kennedy took the presidency, I think Nikita Khrushchev saw in him somebody who could be exploited. He thought he was callow and inexperienced. And then shortly into John F. Kennedy's tenure in office, he, he stubs his toe in the presidency by uh, getting into the Bay of Pigs fiasco, where America got a huge black eye in the world community. And, and I think at that moment, uh, Nikita Khrushchev sees he has somebody he can exploit. He then, the two of them then meet at a summit, uh, a very famous summit in Vienna, uh, where Khrushchev gets the better of John F. Kennedy and realizes he comes ac- uh, out of it saying uh, he's, he's too intelligent and too weak. And I think that gives him, uh, Khrushchev, an opportunity to exploit what he perceives John F. Kennedy's weakness as being and ships. Uh, uh, arms to nuclear weaponry to to Cuba, just 90 miles off American shores. Uh, But I think he's underestimated John F. Kennedy. And you see in that moment, in those 13 incredibly perilous days, as I mentioned, you see a new John F. Kennedy, somebody who's resolved to finding a peaceful end to this crisis, but ensuring that the Soviets back down. And that's precisely what happens. I was... (laughs) I got a real picture of the two of them when you talked about Kennedy being six feet tall and Khrushchev being what five three or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Khrushchev was not intimidated. Well, and, they couldn't look more different. You know, you, you, you they, at, at that at that, that time when there was a a summit between the the two superpowers, the United States of America and the the Soviet Union, all the the world was watching. It was like a heavyweight bout between two great contenders, and particularly with John F. Kennedy having just come into the presidency with such great acclaim, uh, where there were such great hopes for his presidency. So the world was watching when the two of them got together. And and at first, it looked like uh, John F. Kennedy had a, an enormous advantage just because of the aesthetics. He was taller. He, looked, he, he walked onto the stage with uh, you know the grace of a leading man. And then you have Nikita Khrushchev, who is hardly the leading man type. He's more of a character actor. So there was a great disparity, uh, but that advantage quickly waned as the very pugnacious uh, Nikita Khrushchev really dug into John F. Kennedy and, as I mentioned, got the better of him during this two-day summit. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you what your opinion is of what's going on today. There's a conflict going on in Ukraine initiated by the Russians. Are there lessons that our leaders could learn? from the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, you see what, what Kennedy does. Again, these are, these are 13 incredibly dangerous days, perhaps the most dangerous moment in the history of humankind, uh, which is really saying something. We came uh, incredibly close to a nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And, and what you see in Kennedy is he doesn't listen to his very jingoistic military advisor, the brass hats, he calls them. They are very bellicose. They are very much of the mind that we should engage militarily with the Soviets during this uh, uh, incredibly uh, perilous moment in history. Uh, But John F. Kennedy resists that because he has taken the advice of his military advisors with the Bay of Pigs, and he's been led astray by them. So he's very wary of that advice. He is desperate to find a a peaceful resolution to this. He knows that Nikita Khrushchev has to save face in some manner, and he tries to give him a way out. Uh, And I think that's a lesson for Joe Biden. Keep keep, Keep a cool head, exercise all of your options, rally as John F. Kennedy did, Western support around this. Know that this is a PR mission for, for, uh, in, in some respects. You have to tell the world why this, this aggression cannot stand. And that's essentially what, what John F. Kennedy does. And uh, what, what we didn't realize until much later, Kathy, is that there, uh, 
was a back um, uh, a, a back channel between uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the, the United States uh, with Bobby Kennedy on our side, trying to negotiate an end. And one of the things that we did six months, very quietly, six months after the Cuban Missile Crisis had abated, was we withdrew missiles from Turkey, uh, nuclear missiles that we that had gone into Turkey very close to the Soviet border during the Eisenhower administration. So it was almost a quid pro quo. You take your missiles out of Cuba, which is danger, which is in our backyard, and we'll take our missiles out of Turkey. The world didn't know about that, that agreement, but it was an incredibly important facet in a peaceful resolution to the Cuban Missile Crisis. You mentioned how Kennedy saw foreign policy as sort of his um, his main mission as a president, but then he got very much drawn into having to do something about civil rights because of the time he was in. Can you talk a little bit about that trajectory? You, you know, and you're absolutely right. Drawn in is the right is the right word because John F. Kennedy, although he had been instrumental in getting Martin Luther King released from a rural Georgia prison, which could have been fatal for King uh, during uh, Kennedy's campaign for president in 1960, he really wasn't committed to the area of civil rights. But it was Martin Luther King and others in the civil rights movement that were doing these, what they would call direct action campaigns throughout the course of Kennedy's presidency that compelled the president to first react, which he did initially, and then, then act in the area of civil rights. So there are a number of crises that he has to face. One is the freedom rides, uh, the attempt to integrate uh, bus lines throughout the South, that is in the spring and summer of 1961. And then you get the matriculation uh, of uh, a student at Ole Miss uh, in 1962, which ends up being an incredibly violent chapter in the, in the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, you then get uh, a campaign led by Martin Luther King in Birmingham to, sh to, to try to integrate Birmingham, which was probably the most virulently racist uh, city in America. Uh, so all eyes are focused on, on, on Birmingham. And finally, John F. Kennedy is compelled to do something, not just ensure the protection of marchers and, and ensure their rights are being carried out, but actually make a statement to the American people about the importance of civil rights. And he finally, in June of 1963, goes on television. This is after George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, has stood in the doorway of a, uh, an administration building at the University of, of Alabama to prevent the integration of that institution. John F. Kennedy realizes this because it's getting huge attention. And in order to preempt it, he goes on television and makes this extraordinarily, mostly extemporaneous speech about the need for civil rights in our country. And who would want to walk in the shoes of an African American when uh, the, the, the racism and the bigotry is so manifest? Uh, and he calls civil rights a moral issue. This is the first time that it's been raised to that level in American discourse. And it changes a lot. It, it, the the African-American community is delighted with the fact that the president of the United States has elevated the civil rights movement to a, a moral issue. Uh, and he calls for the Civil Rights Act of 1963, which would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and would be pushed through Congress due to the indomitable will I mentioned of Lyndon Johnson. It certainly felt like a much more hopeful time for everyone, I think, in America. And um, maybe some of that is because of his grace. Is that what you sort of concluded? Well, I think that had some to do with it. And I'll, I'll give you uh, an example. As I mentioned, he won the presidency by just a, a whisper, two tenths of a percentage point. But he comes into the presidency um, with the goodwill of the people. Uh, af after his inauguration speech, I think the, the American people are doubly fascinated with, with uh, John F. Kennedy. In fact, just a few days later, he makes his first press conference. And it is nationally televised. And a third of all Americans are watching this very prosaic press conference from the president of the United States, in which, among other things, he asks Americans to stop sending 
telegrams and letters because the White House is flooded with them at that point. And I also mentioned the Bay of Pigs, Kathy, and it's very telling that even though he makes an enormous mistake just three months after taking the presidency with the Bay of Pigs, he comes out of that with an approval rating of 83%. This is somebody who's barely won the presidency, and yet Americans are all aligned behind him in this most desperate hour of his presidency, where he has gotten a black eye in front of the entire world. But it was a different world in many respects. I think we were a different people. You didn't see um, the, the, the divisiveness between parties. You didn't see the fragmentation of media, where we live in these media echo chambers, where we're hearing the, the point of view that we want to hear. You had three television networks. You had ABC, CBS, and NBC. And there was greater, I think, even-handedness in the media at that time. But I very much hope that we can get to get back to a time when Americans realize that there's more that unites us than divides us. And I think Kennedy, in, in, in Lincoln, Lincoln-esque terms, in so many ways, because of his soaring rhetoric, brought out our better angels. I have to ask you, you brought up the media and something I've always wondered about was, you know, we know he had liaisons. We know that now. Um, we know about his health issues. A lot of that wasn't very well meant, very mentioned at all, really, in the media. I, maybe his health, but certainly not anything to do with infidelity. You know, what, how, you know, how much does that play into his, his image of being sort of Camelot? And what would it be like today for him? Well, very different today. Um, but, you know, in terms of the Camelot image, I think there have been revelations that that have come out about John F. Kennedy since his presidency that that certainly tarnish his image and for good reason. Uh, as I mentioned, he stood on feet of clay at 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 at, at, at times. This is a madman era president who we need to look at in the through the lens of a Me Too America. Uh, and he does not look particularly good in, in so many respects. There's, there was a, a revelation that came out in a book by uh, Robert Dalek, uh, a wonderful historian earlier in the, the millennium in which he talks about a relationship that John F. Kennedy had with one of his interns, a 19-year-old intern who lost her virginity to John F. Kennedy. And if you look at how she was objectified, it's hard to forgive John F. Kennedy for that kind of behavior. It was a very different era in many respects, but that kind of exploitation is is really, it's really scandalous. Um, so there's a lot about Kennedy's nature. Again, this is an extraordinarily enigmatic man in the same way that in some, some ways Lyndon Johnson was as well, but that's hard to justify, even though it was a very different era in, in the United States of America. Most, I remember talking to Gerald Ford about Congress when uh, when he was a member. And he said at that time, most of his colleagues were having illicit affairs. That was pretty common practice in Washington at that time. And certainly John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson were no exceptions. Gerald Ford, however, was, I should caveat that by saying, I don't think that uh, uh, Gerald Ford was a flanderer, but most of his counterparts, including John F. Kennedy were. Your book is meticulously researched, um, and you even have some first-person interviews, you know, with people who knew Kennedy. Can you tell us a little bit about your research process and the writing process? You know, I, I, I have the great good fortune, as I mentioned, of having led a, um, a presidential library in the, the LBJ library and uh, have gotten to know my counterparts through the years, and I've had occasion to do research at their libraries. So I spent a lot of time at the John F. Kennedy Library They've amassed a wonderful collection of oral histories. So even though most of the principles, if not all the principles of the, the Kennedy administration are now long gone, you still have these wonderful uh, recollections of the administration through the oral history collections that they've amassed. And they're also, the presidential libraries are the source of primary source material. I was also able to interview uh, some of the few folks uh, who are still alive and can remember, including uh, notably Andrew Young. Andrew Young was the uh, uh, indispensable aide to Martin Luther King, just turned 90 earlier this year. And I spent a great deal of time talking to Andrew Young about 
John F. Kennedy's contributions to civil rights. So that was a, it was very illuminating to hear first person accounts uh, of this president as well. So you mentioned LBJ. Why was there such a complicated relationship with LBJ? There were complicated relationships uh, throughout LBJ's life because LBJ himself was a complicated character, enormously complicated. And we tend to think of this fractious relationship between the Kennedys and Lyndon Johnson. That seems to be a popular narrative in history. But it's slightly inaccurate because the, the Kennedy, Kennedys were not monolithic. There was an extraordinarily toxic relationship between Bobby Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. There's no denying that. The two could not have been more different. And for various reasons, they resented one another. And the contempt one might have had for the other was reciprocated in kind. John Kennedy, however, was, I think, a great admirer of Lyndon Johnson. When John Kennedy was a senator from Massachusetts and, and sitting in Congress, the all-powerful majority leader was Lyndon Johnson, perhaps the most powerful majority leader in the history of our nation. So if Kennedy wanted to get something through the Senate, he had to go through Lyndon Johnson. He was beholden to Lyndon Johnson to make that happen. And he saw uh, LBJ's great facility with power, his great understanding of power, and he appreciated it. He also knew he couldn't win the presidency in all likelihood without carrying the South. And you needed a, a bona fide Southerner in order to do that. So it is unlikely that John F. Kennedy would have become president at all, but for the fact that Lyndon Johnson rounded out his ticket as a Southerner who had the trust of the very powerful Southern lawmakers of the time and hence uh, the, uh, the trust of the, uh, the, the Democratic electorate in the South. Can you talk a little bit about that transition that happened after JFK's assassination, um, transitioning the presidency to LBJ? You know, one of the things I, I realized in, in researching this book, Kathy, is, is this incredible moment um, in the summer, uh, early fall of, of 1963. This is two months before uh, John F. Kennedy is mortally wounded in, in Dallas. And he's on a boat, he has just lost a, a son um, his, his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, prematurely gives birth to their son, Patrick, who lives for just two days before dying. Uh, John F. Kennedy is aware of his own mortality. He battled illness throughout the course of his life. He was in a, a near fatal uh, situation in World War II when his ship went down. Uh, so uh, he has this tenuous hold on life. And I think one of the reasons you see such vitality from from Kennedy throughout the course of his life is he's he's so aware of how short life might be. And he's drifting on the Nantucket Sound in a sailboat. And he asks one of the friends who's joining him, what would it be like if Lyndon had the presidency? That's out of the blue. And of course, two months later, uh, John Kennedy is felled by an assassin's bullet in Dallas on, on November 22nd, 1963. And Lyndon Johnson is hurled accidentally, accidentally into the presidency. Uh, but I, I will say that while John F. Kennedy had some golden moments during the course of his uh, abridged presidency, you see one of the best moments uh, in Lyndon Johnson after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He realizes that he can use the martyrdom of John F. Kennedy to push through the Civil Rights Act that I mentioned earlier, the, the Civil Rights Act that John F. Kennedy had proposed in the summer of 1963, but didn't have the political muscle or maybe the political will to get through Congress. Lyndon Johnson realizes he can exploit this moment in order to get the Civil Rights Act passed in, in uh, memory of the, the slain, our beloved slain president. But, it, but his advisors, the very evening that he takes the presidency, warn him not to do so. Because if he does, he will alienate the South and may risk losing the presidency in his own right when he runs in 1964. And Lyndon Johnson, who's this creature of power, listens to the advice of his advisors and says, what the hell's the presidency for? And he goes before the American public just five days after the assassination of Kennedy in the very same hour in which Kennedy lost his life 
and he tells the American people that we need to do this to honor John F. Kennedy. And just as John F. Kennedy had said uh, uh, that we shall begin a new era in uh, American life, Lyndon Johnson tells the American people, we must continue this new era. So it's a wonderful chapter in the book and in the life of, uh, of Lyndon Johnson. You wrote a previous book about LBJ, and but now you're, you know, this book with JFK. Why, why write about JFK and why now? There's an old saying, write the book you want to read. And I've read a lot of books about John F. Kennedy. Uh, but what I wanted was a brisk take on his very consequential, uh, very turbulent, and in some ways, very hopeful presidency. Why is John F. Kennedy so alluring all these years later? He's been dead for nearly 60 years, and yet he has this outsized presence in American life still. And for so many, he is the personification of, of greatness. A lot of that is due to the Camelot mythology, but I wanted to get a, a very honest take on this president. I think he's, he shows flashes of greatness at times, and he stands on feet of clay at others. But I wanted to demythologize Kennedy and show episodically what was happening in this presidency. Why was 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 is he such a fascinating character, and and how does did his leadership result in uh, what was, for all practical purposes? this very important time in American history. You mentioned the peaceful resolution to uh, the, 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 the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, where afterward, the tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, diminish somewhat. You mentioned civil rights and the ultimately the, aggress the, the active stand that he makes toward the fruition of civil rights. We could also talk about the moonshot. Uh, John F. Kennedy boldly proclaiming that we will go to the moon at a time, but before the end of the of the 1960s, at a time when we were far behind the Soviet Union in the space race. It was an incredibly bold act. And as I mentioned, he got Americans to reach beyond themselves. So I think at a time when we are seeing um, such division and polarization in America, I wanted to look at what made this guy tick and why he remains such a, a, a fascination. And I think I've been able to do that with, with this book. Well, Mark Updegrove, thank you so much for being with us today. The book is Incomparable Grace, JFK in the Presidency, and it's at Left Bank Books. We really appreciate you being here. Fascinating conversation and a fascinating book. Thanks so much for having me, Catherine.